Good morning. It's now been four weeks since we've met together. It's just weird for me. I don't like it at all, and I've heard from many of you that you don't like it. I, I don't think I've missed four weeks of church in a row my entire life. But what I do know is that this church and the church has endured way greater struggles than this. And we'll press on, and we'll come out on the other side. God's church will always endure. Last week, I started the Easter series entitled, This Changes Everything. And I want to reiterate that that doesn't mean that God changed. It doesn't mean that, that God is different today than He was yesterday. God, as a matter of fact, is the same yesterday, today, and will be the same tomorrow. But sometimes when we say this changes everything, what we're really saying is, is that it's possible that rather than something changing outside of us, that our perception of things has changed, that, that maybe we've learned something new or discovered something new, and therefore it's changed everything for us. Let me give you an example. When a young boy or a young girl begins to, to learn how to read, They'll start with simple words such as ball or cat or mom or dad. But soon, they'll begin to put words together in phrases or short sentences. And it won't be long before they're learning to read paragraphs. And not too long after that, books. And once they learn to read, that changes their entire world. It's not that literacy is new. It's just that now they've learned it. And now what used to be just black rubbish on white paper now makes sense to them. And they can now, they can now read thoughts and ideas and expressions that, that once they couldn't see. Today we're looking at an event that changed everything. It is, it is an event that changed everything, but also it changed the perception of God, our understanding of God, and it changed it for all of mankind, and specifically in our passage today, for one man in particular. But again, this morning, we're going to do what we do every Sunday morning. We're going to pause for a little bit. We're going to take a break from the preaching. We're going to take a break from singing. And we're going to be still and go to our Lord. So I'm going to be silent for just a moment as we pray. And I'm going to invite that you pray right where you are. Perhaps you want to get on your knees. Maybe you're sitting on the couch and you just simply turn around and get on your knees and pray. You can stay seated. Maybe you want to stand up and, and raise your hands in prayer. However you feel comfortable. But let's be still before the Lord. And then I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today knowing that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one who created us and you are the one who sustains us. And Lord, we come to you this morning still in a situation where we simply don't know what's going to happen when this, as this virus moves across our world. And Lord, the reality is that we've never known what tomorrow brings. But Lord, this morning I pray that during this time, during this time when we are secluded from one another, we can't 
come together and meet in um, our church. We can't come together and shake hands and hug each other's necks that, Lord, you will still move among your people. Lord, we pray during this time that we spend time with you, that we seek you. The Lord, that we come out of this stronger in our faith, not weaker. And Lord, I pray that during this time, you will bless the reading of your word and the preaching of your word and the listening of your word. Lord, I especially pray that you will bless the application of your word. Lord, I pray for great things. I pray that wherever this is being heard, whether that's just right around the corner in someone's home or it's across the world, that, Lord, you will do what I cannot do. You will change hearts. You will change minds. You will change lives because you call people into a relationship. And for those of us who already know you as Father, that, Lord, you will call us into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, I pray all of these things in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of Luke, chapter 23, and we're going to look at verses 44 through 49. Now let me remind you very briefly that when you get to the book of Luke, what you have is a man who has written an orderly account of what has happened. Sometimes when we talk about uh, this story or that story in the Bible, I, I tend to say, no, let's look at this event, not necessarily a story, because sometimes stories are, are, are associated with make-believe, but these events happen. And so I want to remind you what Luke wrote in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. This is what he wrote. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of these things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and minister of word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now just... For a moment, I want to draw your attention to the word accomplished. Because he says there in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. You see, Jesus came to accomplish not only things, but one thing specifically. We read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, it says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God sent His Son because He loves us so that we might live, glorifying Him and enjoying Him forever. So when we look at this, this is an orderly account of what happened when Jesus died. Now I realize this is Palm Sunday, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, but I want us to read this passage, and then we'll begin to dive into what's happening here. I'm going to ask, just like I always do, that you would stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle and they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Would you please be seated? For 20 years, I've been preaching during the Easter season. And as we line up with history, like I said, this is Palm Sunday. 
It's one that we associate with a multitude of disciples gathering along as Jesus goes into the city of Jerusalem and they are rejoicing and praising God because they had seen mighty works happen through Jesus Christ. We even label this passage of Palm Sunday when Jesus arrives there, we even label it as His triumphal entry. But what we miss is this, is that while they were cheering, Jesus was weeping. You see, he was weeping because he knew what was ahead of him. But he also knew what was ahead for Israel. So today, we're not going to line up with history. And I'm not preaching on Paul, about Palm Sunday. But what I'm going to preach about is the death of Jesus Christ, as we've just read. We're going to talk about Good Friday. And you may be asking yourself, Good Friday. Really? Is it really good? A day when an innocent man was wrongly accused, he was mocked, tortured, and then executed. You call that Good Friday? Good Friday when, when people lashed out at this man and his friends and his disciples and his family mourned as he is tortured and killed? Good Friday? But people... It's Good Friday because it changed everything. And soon our perception, their perception, the, the perception of his friends, of his disciples, of his family, it would change. And that's the reason we call it Good Friday, even though the things that happened on that day were certainly tragic. Now I want to give you a quick timeline that leads up to Jesus' death. And I can't, I can't give you everything that's recorded in Scripture, but... Let me just begin by saying that Friday morning, the events surrounding Jesus, it happened very early, at least by 7 o'clock in the morning. Of course, the previous night, Jesus had already celebrated the Passover, and as I preached last week, He, he had washed the disciples' feet. But it, it, had, it had been an agonizing night. He knew what was ahead of Him, and, and He went and prayed that if it was possible that this cup would pass. His closest disciples couldn't even stay awake for one hour to pray with Him. One of His disciples would go and betray Him and hand Him over with a kiss. The other 11 disciples would scatter and leave Him. And Peter would deny Him. So it was an agonizing night. But the next morning, by 7 o'clock, the Sanhedrin, they didn't waste any time. They took him to Pilate. They really didn't have anything to charge him with. They just knew this. They wanted him dead. They also knew this, that a religious charge was not going to get them anywhere with Pilate. So they had to turn it into a political charge. So as they began to press that Pilate needed to take care of this political issue, Pilate heard a word that he found very interesting and he, he acted on, and that was that Jesus was from Galilee. Well, there you go. He's done with this. And he sends him to Herod because Herod is, has jurisdiction over the Galileans. Herod is both flattered and he's glad. He's flattered because the governor, the prefect, Pilate, acknowledged that he has jurisdiction. But he's glad because he's always wanted to see Jesus. He's heard things about Jesus. But in reality... He just wanted a magic show. And that's the extent of Jesus today for many. The interest in Jesus is, is simply about their entertainment. It's about their needs. It's about their enjoyment. But like Herod, if that doesn't come to fruition, well, then they're done with him. You can imagine that he's there looking for a magic show and he gets nothing. And almost like a comedian who, who gets up and, and tells jokes, but, but then no one laughs. And they begin to heckle the comedian. This is what happens with Jesus. He does not produce any magic, if you will. And so what happens is, in the court of Herod, he is he's mocked and treated with contempt. And then Herod has no more use for him, so he sends him back to Pilate. Well, when he gets back to Pilate, the Sanhedrin is unrelenting. And Pilate simply asked the question because they've been saying, hey, he claims to be a king, he claims to be a king, he claims to be a king. So Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now listen to what happens here. Because in that moment, Jesus even extends an invitation 
to Pilate. Pilate, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say, say it to you about me? And people, it really is, what it boils down to is, what do you believe? Do you believe what you've just heard? Do you believe what your spouse has said? What your parents have said? What your children have said? What your friends have said? What do you believe? So here was a chance for Pilate to say, are you king of the Jews? Yes, I believe you're king. But instead, are you, are you, are you just repeating what you've heard? Well, Pilate dismisses the question, but he cannot afford an uprising. He hears the chants, crucify him, crucify him. And so in the final exchange with the Sanhedrin, he asked the question, shall I crucify your king? And the final words of the chief priest loudly proclaim how far the nation of Israel has gone. Think about this for a moment. As they're brought out of Egypt, here is the King of kings and the Lord of lords leading the people of Israel. A column of fire, a cloud. They hear His voice. And then later they say, no, 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 we don't want, we don't want that. We want our own king. We want a king from among us. And so they, they get a king, an Israelite king. And now look at what the chief priests proclaim. He asked the question, Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? And this is what they say, we have no king but Caesar. One writer put it like this, with this proclamation, Judaism was, in the person of its representatives, guilty of denial of God, of blasphemy, of apostasy. So Jesus is tortured. And then he's led out to a place called Golgotha. His hands and his feet are nailed to the cross and he's hung there to die slowly an agonizing, torturous death. Crucifixion was invented to make death as painful and as lingering as human endurance could tolerate. And by the way, all of this has now taken place and it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Well, while he's there at the cross, there are four Roman soldiers that are assigned to him. So each each person that's hanging on a cross has four Roman soldiers. It's these soldiers who, who take Jesus' garments and they keep them for themselves, except for the tunic. It's the most valuable garment. And they gamble and they cast lots over that article to see who's going to get that piece of clothing. But then we get to verse 44, and that's where we will catch up with our passage because it says, it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So it is noon. That is what the sixth hour is. It's noon. And we're told that there is darkness over the whole land. You think about that. At the moment where the sun should have been its brightest and the shadows should have been at their shortest, there's this darkness. And, and why would that be? Is it possible it's because the light of all mankind was slowly dying? This is not a huge thunderstorm, nor is it an eclipse. This is a miracle. This is God demonstrating again His power over nature, but more was coming. And so we reach this point, the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon. And the synoptic gospel tells us that several things took place. The earth shook, the rocks were split, that many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs. But I want us to focus on these three miracles that are presented right here in this passage. The first two may seem like they're superficial or natural, if you will, or material, but they certainly have spiritual significance. So we first have this darkness over the land. One author wrote it this way. When Jesus died, a shudder ran through all of nature. So the first point I want you to see here is that God calls man to pay attention. The darkness that comes upon the land represents God's judgment on our sins. Darkness is often associated with God's judgment. I'm going to put some passages up for you. I'm not going to read them all to you this morning. But in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, verse 30. Amos chapter 2, verse 18 through 20. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. 
And then also in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 30. Acts chapter 2, verse 20. Revelation chapter 6, verse 20 through 13. When God brought Israel the law, He used nature in a mighty way to get Israel's attention. If you remember when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai, we're told in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, it says this, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud in the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. It got their attention. Things changed for Israel at that point, and now things were changing for the whole world. God's covenant with Abraham was coming to fruition. Through him, through that covenant, through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. Please note that the darkness was not just over Jerusalem, but over the whole land. God was once again using nature and earthquake, rock splitting, darkness to get the attention, not just of Israel, but of all the world. People, this changed everything. No more sacrifices. It was done. It was over. This changed everything for all people, for Jew and Greek, for slave and free, for male and female, for everyone. We're living in a time right now where I would ask the question, does God have your attention? There are people right now who are claiming this is God's judgment on the world as this virus wreaks havoc. While others say, no, it's not God's judgment. I'm not here to address that. I will say this. On my way to do this recording, I was listening to a secular radio station. What was interesting is the DJ made two comments that really grabbed my attention. The first one was, he said, we need to pray. We need to pray for the world. The second thing was, As he said, this pandemic is making us realize that we are mortal. Does he have your attention? You see, daily, if you turn on the news, we are faced with the mortality rate of this virus. But in reality, the death rate is 100%. Every one of us will physically die. God's Word tells us in Romans chapter 6, Verse 23, it says that the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. But when Jesus died on the cross, he paid that debt for us. The judgment of God that is due us was then put upon Jesus. The darkness that came in as as God's judgment came. But that same passage that says the wages of sin is death also says this, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. The free gift is salvation for all who simply believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So for a secular radio DJ, God's got His attention. We need to pray. And we're mortal. We're not going to live forever. Does He have your attention? God used nature to grab the attention of the world this darkness that came over the land at noon, when it should have been at its brightest, it's now dark as God's judgment is poured out on Jesus who takes on the sins of the world. But I want to move on to verse 45. It says, While the, while the light sun fell and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now I realize that many of you know what this is, but for those of you who don't, This was the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The high priest would enter the holy of holies one day a year, the day of atonement. And on that day, he would burn incense and he would sprinkle the blood of the the sacrificed animal to atone for the sins of Israel. But God tears that veil from top to bottom. It is a miracle. Otherwise, it would not be recorded. From top to bottom, it is torn. Because the second thing I want you to gather here is that God calls the world to come to Him. Not only does does Jesus take on the sins of the world and pays the price, God is saying, look, there's not going to be a barrier anymore between myself and my children. There's not going to be a barrier anymore. Come to me. Come to me. This is another miracle. No longer would a high priest have to go in and represent me or you or anyone, 
But all could approach the Father now. Every one of us can approach the Father through the Son. Let me read to you just two short passages. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, it says this. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. You see, Jesus is now your high priest. You don't go to another person. He becomes your high priest. He is sitting at the right hand of God. But then listen to what it also says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. So there's a new and living way. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. God calls the world to him. No longer curtain. It's ripped. It's torn apart. Come to the Father through Jesus Christ. His flesh is that curtain now. That, that's who you go through. But I want to continue. Could you get to verse 47? And it says, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Let me be clear about this. Not only was the veil ripped in the temple, but the veil covering the eyes of the centurion was removed. He finally saw Jesus Christ for who he really was. I love the way one author expressed it because here's this centurion. He's experiencing the earthquake, the darkness. He's experiencing all of these things. And listen to what one author wrote. Signs like these on special occasions are a part of God's ways in dealing with man. He knows the desperate stupidity and unbelief of human nature. He sees it necessary to arouse our attention by miraculous works. God not only calls the world to come to Him, but God calls the individuals to come to Him. I cannot speak for the crowds that returned home beating their breast. Without a doubt, they left very heavy-hearted and self-condemned. They, they showed up to see a spectacle. That's what it says. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, is it going to be a show? Is it going to be something they enjoyed? Is it going to be entertainment? And now they're no longer at ease with what they've witnessed. And they know that what they've just seen, it's not right. It shouldn't have taken place. So I don't really know what happened with them. If they just had a moment of regret, or they actually returned home changed. But I do have some insight about this centurion. He not only knew that what took place was not right, he knew that the one who was killed was righteous. He was innocent. It says in the book of Matthew that the centurion makes the confession that Jesus was the Son of God. And it says right here in Luke that he praised God. Do you realize that's... That's the first time that you praise God without, without knowing Jesus Christ. You are not praising God. I don't care what words you say. The only way you can get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. And that is when you praise God, when you recognize God for who He is. This experienced soldier, one surely calloused in all that he had seen through the years, finally got it. He witnessed the injustice. He witnessed the taunting. He witnessed the mockeries. He even witnessed the conversion of one of the thieves next to Jesus. And then he saw a man, Jesus Christ, he saw this man who didn't have his life taken from him, but he saw a man who gave his life up. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gives his life up freely so that you and I can have life. So what about you this morning? Is God calling you? 
Will this morning be the first time that you praise God by acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is righteous? Is this the first time that you will see Jesus Christ for who He is and begin to glorify the Lord? Hear me on this. You can go to God right now, right where you are. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You don't need an elder. You don't need a minister. You don't need a deacon. You don't need a teacher. What you need is Christ. And if you have Jesus Christ, you can go to the Father. Jesus Christ is your high priest. You can confess your sins and you can call upon Him to forgive you and trust Him as your Lord and Savior. You don't need to wait until our church can meet again. You don't need to wait at all. If the Lord is calling you, come to Him. He ripped the veil. He ripped the curtain so that you can go to Him. Has He gotten your attention? Is He calling you as a person to simply put your faith in Jesus Christ? What will you do this morning? Perhaps you're sitting there with your spouse and you realize that you need Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to turn to your husband or to your wife and say, I need Jesus. Would you, would you kneel with me and I want to pray. I want to pray to Him. I want to confess my sin. And I want to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want Him to be my Lord and Savior. Maybe... Maybe child or teenager, you need to turn to your parent and say, I need Jesus Christ. What will you do this morning? I'm going to pray, but I can't do anything for you. Only God can save you. Will you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for your word. We're grateful for the way that through this virus right now that maybe you are getting some people's attention that you didn't have before. Lord, we're grateful that you made a way that we can come directly to you. We're grateful for the calling that you've put on each of our lives, those of us who are brothers and sisters who are your children. But Lord, we're crying out to you right now that people will see you for who you are for the very first time, that they will put their faith in Christ, that they will confess their sin, that you will change their heart, that they will be repentant men and women, boys and girls. Lord, I pray this morning that you are using your word to go forth and change people and change the world. That Lord, when Jesus Christ came and when he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and he rose again, this changed everything. And Lord, I pray that people are experiencing individual change right now as they cry out to you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I ask these things. Amen. I really appreciate the fact that many of you are taking the time to watch these videos and worship with your family. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday on Easter Sunday. And once again, I'll bring you the Easter sermon, but in a different format, through video rather than face-to-face. But we will truly celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Church, I love you, and I look forward to seeing you again.